So in the last lecture, we were talking about uh, vectorization and we're looking at various different things that can become sort of impediments to being able to do vectorization. And we we're looking at, at data dependencies pre previously. What I want to look at now are control flow dependencies and how they can impact uh, vectorization. So what's meant by a control flow dependency is something like the value of some data can affect, you know, what branches and so on you take in the code. Uh, this loop here ha has a control flow dependency. Uh, basically what's happening here is inside the body of the loop, we have something that's effectively an if statement, this ternary operator. So depending on whether this condition is true or not, either we'll evaluate the expression before the colon or the expression after the colon. So effectively, depending on what AI happens to be equal to, you get two different types of behavior inside the loop. And the, the uh, we say that AI, like the, the value AI has a control flow, or introduces a control flow dependency. And these types of uh, dependencies are sometimes quite tricky for the compiler to be able to handle when you're vectorizing. Because if you imagine that you start unrolling this loop and then you're gonna take the unrolled loop and, and basically vectorize it, the problem that you run into is the different iterations don't have the same structure because some of them might be doing this computation and some of them might be doing that, well, not really doing any computation, it's basically just giving a value that can be assigned to something else. Uh, so vectorization, you know, the instructions that most CPUs have don't, don't really lend themselves well to doing this sort of uh, this sort of uh, code in a vectorized form. Because essentially the processors want to do all the same things to all of the elements in the vector that are being processed. And effectively by having control flow dependencies like this, we're effectively saying that we'd like different things to happen to different elements in the vector. Uh, a good compiler might be able to vectorize the code that's actually given here because there's not too many control, uh, control flow dependencies um, but it starts to get tricky very quickly. So it means generally advisable not to have any control flow dependencies at all in a, a loop if you want to factorize it. And if you do need to have some kind of uh, such dependencies, you want to try to minimize them because very quickly the compiler will reach a point where it won't be able to factorize your code. Uh, the next impediment to vectorization is aliasing, which we kind of touched on a little bit in some of the material leading up to this point. Uh, so we've, we've encountered aliasing in other contexts in the course. I mean, aliasing can introduce, you know, bugs, for example, into assignment operators, compound assignment operators, a very common sort of bug. Uh, aliasing, again, is when you, you can access the same memory location through different names. Uh, so this, is, this uh, code example here is illustrating aliasing. So we have a, an array of floats called V64 floats. And then we create a pointer to a float, which is pointing to the first element in the array, which is called P. We create another uh, pointer to another element in the array called Q, which is pointing to the second element, the one with index one. So in terms of the picture, what we have is our array V here. P is pointing to the zeroth element. Q is pointing to the element with index one. And for example, by using, by using like P with, with an index of one or subscript of one and Q with a subscript of zero, they're both referring to the same place in memory. Uh, essentially, if we access uh, Q with an index of zero, well, effectively what this means is we're going to take the pointer Q, we're going to add zero to it, which doesn't change anything, and then we're going to dereference what that new pointer points to, which is just the same as what we started out with, which is going to refer to this element here. Um, if we take P1, apply a subscript of one to the pointer P, what this is going to do is going to take the pointer P, which is pointing here, add one to it, which will cause it to point to the next successive element, and then we're going to dereference what's there. Uh, so we have two different names that we can use to refer to the same location in memory. Namely, this location here could be referred to by the name Q0 or by the name P1. And this sort of thing can introduce a lot of problems in terms of vectorization. There's a lot of situations where um, maybe you might be looking at your code after the fact saying, well, why, why did the compiler not vectorize this? And often a common cause for this is that you, you overlook the fact that aliasing could happen. And if aliasing does happen, the compiler can't really determine either that it's safe to do the, the vectorization or maybe if it did do it, it would incur too much of a cost. Like it wouldn't necessarily be a profitable optimization to perform. So it just omits it. So maybe to give some examples of like how aliasing can cause problems, this is just a very kind of trivial example. Uh, we have a function called func. It has uh, takes in three pointers to ints a, b, and c, and then we have like very very simple code inside, just doing a few assignments. So we're taking whatever a points to, assigning it 42, whatever b points to, assigning it zero, and whatever c points to, we're just assigning it star a. Um, you, when you look at this code, you might say, well. Um, is, isn't this always going to be the case that, that this last line here is just going to be setting star C equal to 42? In other words, could the compiler not just optimize this code and rewrite it this way? Because I mean, come on, I mean, I'm writing 42, star A is being written with the value 42 and I'm reading it here. I mean, how could it not be 42? 
Um, but the thing is, it, it isn't necessarily 42 because you could have aliasing happen. For example, what happens if the pointers A and B are equal? So you call this function with this pointer here equal to this pointer here. If you do this, then this optimization of the code would not be valid. Like it would actually cause different behavior in the code because if A and B are equal, what happens is that you actually have a dead store. Like the first write that you do here is, is not used. You're immediately overwriting it with a new value because if B and A are same, the same, basically pointing to the same place in memory, then this second line here is the same as saying star A equals zero. So you're saying star A equals 42, then immediately you're overwriting it with zero. And then you're taking that zero and assigning it to C, well, star C. Um, so this is just a, like a very simple example because like a code is like very, very trivial. And yet this thing can be broken due to aliasing. So you can imagine when you start to get kind of more useful code, like other than what we have here, aliasing can really become a big problem. And it, it's often very difficult for the compiler to come up with any conclusions about whether aliasing can happen. In most cases, the compiler won't have enough information to deduce whether aliasing could occur. So therefore it must assume that it does. And, and maybe as a result of this, it doesn't perform some kind of vectorization or some kind of optimization. In this case, there's no vectorization involved. It's just, just to illustrate the basic problem that aliasing can introduce when you're trying to optimize. Uh, to give an example where we're actually contemplating doing vectorization, we have some code that might make sense to vectorize and then we take aliasing into account. Uh, here we have a, a function which takes in like uh, three vectors, which are assumed to be like 10, 24 elements in size. And it's just gonna add uh, the elements of the uh, vectors B and C and put them into A. Basically, it's computing this inside of a loop. Um, this code here kind of looks just beautiful for vectorization. I mean, you, you know the number of iterations before you enter the loop. In fact, it's even a compile time constant. And you're, the structure of the iterations, there's no like if statements or ternary operators, like there's no control flow dependencies. Everything looks beautiful. and and the iterations of the loop even are completely independent of one another. There's no like flow dependencies or anything. So it's kind of very beautiful code, uh, but the compiler, the compiler uh, due to aliasing concerns, the compiler can't really uh, vectorize this in a way that's going to lead to the most efficient code that you could hope for. Uh, the problem is that you could have aliasing between like well, either A could be alias to B or C or both B and C. In other words, you could have a situation like, uh, for example, suppose that the function add is called where the pointer A that's being passed in is equal to the pointer B plus one. So in other words, you're calling this function here with something like pointer plus one, pointer, and then some other thing. Um, in this case, you're gonna have, effectively, you're gonna have some aliasing happening. And in this case, effectively, what's going to happen if, if you, you make the choice that A is equal to B plus one, then, bi is going to access the same element as ai minus one. And maybe to show this in terms of a diagram, just in case it's not clear why this is the case. So here we have a, just an array, array of floats called x of some size. And, and then we're creating a pointer b, which points to the very first element in x. And then we're creating another pointer, which points to just one after that location by adding one to b. So in terms of a picture, what we have is something like this, where b is pointing to the zeroth element in the array x, and then a is pointing to the one with the element with index one. Um, and you can see here that, for example, I can access the the element x0 by either indexing b with zero, with an index of zero, so I could write something like b0. And what this is basically doing, it's adding zero to b, which doesn't do anything, you get back b, and then you're dereferencing what that result points to, which is just this element here. But I could also access this element as well by saying a of minus one, because you can use negative indexes, so I can use minus one here, and what this will do is it will take the pointer a, which is pointing to here, it will decrement one from it, like decrease it by one, which means it's now going to be pointing here, and then you're dereferencing the result. So A of minus one and B of zero are both referring to the same elements. And you can see that the difference between these indexes, they differ by one. In other words, we have this kind of pattern that B of I is equivalent to A of I minus one because of the fact these two pointers differ by one. So essentially, you have two different ways that you can access the elements in this array by using A and, uh, B, a and B with uh, different indexes. Anyway, any questions about this? This is basically feeding into the example we were just looking at a moment ago. So I go back to the example. Uh, so this is where this claim comes from here, kind of with more details filled in. So we've said that basically bi is the same as ai minus one. And the reason why this is important is that when you look at this code here initially, your reaction might be that this is like very beautiful code for vectorization because you look at it and you say, the key kind of the key, key things is there's no flow dependencies. Like the, the iteration, like the data that's being used in these iterations are all completely independent of one another. 
Um, but in fact, this is not the case because if aliasing happens, effectively what this means in the case specifically we're describing here, like one aliasing scenario where A is chosen to be equal to B plus one. In this case, mm -hmm. then B of I is the same as A of I minus one. In other words, I can take this B of I and I can equivalently write it as A of I minus one. But if I do this, then it becomes more obvious. Like I have a flow dependency here. And in this particular, I have a flow dependency with a dependency distance of one. Uh, because what's happening here is that two adjacent iterations of the loop, one is writing to the variable and one of them is reading. So we have a, basically a, a flow dependence uh, where the dependency distance is one because the difference between I minus one and I is one. In this particular case, since the dependency distance is one, this means that the only safe vectorization factor to use would effectively be one, which means you're just doing scalar computation because if you use a vector of length one, you're not really using vectors. So that the problem here is that if we can't assume anything about aliasing not happening, then it, it precludes us from, at least in the most straightforward way, vectorizing this loop. Um, some compilers will, will still maybe be able to vectorize this if it's profitable, because what you can do is you can essentially at runtime check to see whether aliasing happens. The compiler can insert code to try to figure out, like do the buffers for A, B, and C overlap partially with one another, if it's possible for it to do. And then if it's possible for it to generate code that can test this at runtime, it can insert this code. And then effectively what you get is code that looks like, if there's no aliasing, do this, else do this. And in the case that there's aliasing, the, the, you do a basically sequential version of the loop. You don't actually vectorize it. And in the else clause where it is a vectorizable, you have a vector version of the loop which runs. But this is not the most desirable thing to do because it, it gener makes your code more bulky. Like it's gonna get longer because you essentially have two versions of the code, one which is for vectorized, the vectorized or the case where vectorization is possible where there's no aliasing and in the cases where there is aliasing you do different code also you have to pay the price at runtime because the test is done at runtime so you have to pay the price that it figures out is aliasing happening it costs you computation to figure this out um, so this is not the most desirable way to do things and for this reason maybe in some cases where it's possible to vectorize like in, like you can actually do it by doing this sort of strategy where you have like two versions of the code the compiler might still decide not to do it because it looks and says well the code's going to be so much bigger and maybe for certain cases, it might not be clearly that, that it's going to be faster and so on because of the overhead of checking for, for uh, aliasing and so on might be significant enough that it doesn't want to do the vectorization. Um, so you may actually have vectorization not take place or in, in the best case, you're basically gonna be having like two versions of the code, which again, is not so desirable. How can we try to uh, kind of combat this problem? So for example, what happens if we knew that the function that we were looking at on the previous slide because of the way we're calling it? Because like, we have knowledge the compiler doesn't have. When it's generating the code for the function we are looking at before, it just sees this function and it's being asked to generate code for it. It can't know what are all the possible ways you're gonna call that function. And do any of them ever cause aliasing to happen? So this is like one of the reasons why the compiler has difficulty with it. We may know that because of the way we call a function, the aliasing will never happen. And probably for the code we were looking at, if you look in more detail about the computation it's doing, it's probably unlikely in practice that you would call a function that's doing that type of computation that's aliased in the way we're describing. But the thing is the compiler doesn't know. It looks at the code and say, theoretically, is it possible that someone could call this code in a way that would alias? And it goes, yes, it's possible. Therefore, it has to assume the worst, that, that you will have this happen. Um, so basically what we wanna look at here is, is there some way that we can annotate our code in cases where we know that that function, because of knowledge we have as the people who wrote the code, do we, can, do we know that the function will never be called such that aliasing occurs? And then if we know this is true, how do we signal this to the compiler? So when the compiler is generating the code for that function, just by looking at that function alone, it can make the determination that it's safe, there's no aliasing, and then therefore it can make optimizations that otherwise wouldn't have been safe for it to do. And where this, uh, the way that we accomplish this is using a keyword called restrict. It's supported by a number of compilers. Unfortunately, this is not part of the C++ standard, so this is kind of getting into the world of, of hacks to a certain extent, like it's a non-portable construct. Um, and of course, nobody can agree. We have GCC and Clang, and they call the keyword under war, underscore, underscore, restrict, underscore, underscore. So that, that's the keyword you use if you're GCC and Clang. And you know Microsoft always has to go their own way. So you have like underscore, underscore, restrict without the underscore, underscore at the end if you're working on Microsoft uh, Visual Studio. And then of course, it, it, probably things get worse if you have other compilers. There might be other permutations and combinations of things that they may use for, for indicating this uh, restrict thing. Um, but what restrict does is offense, essentially it gives us a way to annotate our codes telling the compiler that aliasing can't happen. Um, 
because this is something in practice that would be very difficult for the compiler to know. If it, if it sees some function like this one here, where it's taking two pointers in, I mean, how does it know whether you're ever going to call the, that function in a way where those pointers could be referring to the same you know, area in memory? It's really difficult for it to know. Mm -hmm. Is it the same as the restrict uh, qualifier in C? Yeah, there is a restrict. Yeah, so in C, I, I'm, not, I'm not as familiar with the C standard, like in terms of what things are, are in it and so on. I think restrict might actually be I'm not sure. It may actually be a keyword in the C language itself. I'm not sure about this, though. But did that answer your question, Kai? OK. So basically, where you can use the restrict, restrict keyword is anytime you have a pointer or a reference. Like pointers and references are basically have the same sort of problems with respect to aliasing, because essentially, references are basically pointers in disguise. I mean, when you, when you access the thing the reference refers to, really what's happening secretly underneath, you're just dereferencing a pointer in terms of the implementation. So basically, pointer reference, it really doesn't make any difference. They have the same problems with respect to aliasing. So when declaring pointers or references, you can add the restrict qualifier to the pointer or reference type. Now suppose that you have a restricted pointer or reference P, then during the execution of the block in which P is declared, if an object that is accessible through P is modified by any means, then all accesses to that object in that block must occur through P. In other words, data that is accessible through P is not permitted to alias with data that's accessible through other means. So at this point, I'd like to consider a code example. And in particular, I'd like to consider the code example at the bottom of this slide. So here we have this function called func. It takes two pointers to int as parameters. So we have P and Q, which are both uh, having type int star. And suppose now, as the programmer, we know that we never will invoke this function in a way where aliasing can occur. In other words, the chunk of memory that's pointed to by P and the chunk of memory that's pointed to by Q will never overlap. And we want to indicate this to the compiler, because although we may know this, the compiler has no way of knowing how we're going to invoke this function. So we want to signal to the compiler that aliasing can't happen so that the compiler can perform optimization more effectively, knowing that this aliasing can't happen. So in order to accomplish this, what we do is we annotate our code by introducing the restrict keyword into the type for both of these integer pointers. So these are both restricted pointers. And effectively, what this tells the compiler is that when we apply this restrict keyword to this first parameter, it's essentially telling the compiler that any data that's modified using this pointer P will only be accessed through the pointer P. And when we mark this other pointer Q as restricted, what we're saying is that any data that's modified using this pointer is only going to be accessed through this pointer. And because of this, this implies that the data that's pointed to by P and Q can't overlap. And therefore, if we have some code down below here, which is represented by the dot, 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 which is modifying data that's pointed to by both P and Q, the compiler can safely assume that no aliasing is going to happen. And it can therefore perform optimizations that it might not otherwise be able to do if it didn't know that aliasing couldn't happen. And in this way, we can get potentially more efficient vectorized code if you imagine that this code that's represented by the dot, dot, dot is something which could be vectorized. Any questions? Mm -hmm. What happens if you mark them as restrict, but then due to some um, like error on your part, you end up calling it without kind of doing it properly, like you call it with? Right, so you, you basically annotate your code saying, hey, compiler, trust me, there's no aliasing. And yeah. then aliasing happens. Well, in this case, probably the code's not going to work because the, the compiler probably, the, the reason you're using the restrict keyword is probably you, you want, your, you think there's a reasonable expectation the compiler could actually do some additional optimization if you provide that. So if you imagine that the compiler's acting on and saying that the user, the, the programmer has promised aliasing won't happen, and hey, there's optimization I can do, which would not be valid in that if aliasing did happen, but because the programmer's saying it's not happening, I can do this. So it proceeds to do it, it generates the code, and then you violate sort of the contract you've made with the compiler by putting your restrict keyword in, then your code probably will break because it, it will, it's written, the code has been generated assuming that aliasing won't happen. And then some of the problems that we've been talking about, the things that can go wrong, essentially it introduces additional data dependencies, typically when you, when you have aliasing happen, then these data dependencies could make the vectorization invalid. So it actually computes a different result. So yet another obstacle to uh, vectorization is when you have memory that's laid out in non-contiguous areas. So essentially what you're doing is something like what's shown in this loop here, where here we're doing like an add of elements in the array A and the array B and putting them into C. But the thing you'll notice here, if you look more carefully, the index variable I is going up in steps of two. So we're not walking through like the, in the arrays A, B, and C sequentially. We're kind of hopping two at a time or like 
jumping over every second one. So if we try to kind of unroll, the, you know, unroll the loop and then imagine that you're kind of vectorizing the, the unrolled loop, like you unroll it maybe a four times to get a vector length of four, then what you end up with is you're kind of trying to read B0, B2, B4, B6, or something like that. Like, and then for the other vector register, you'd want to load with maybe something like A2, A4, sorry, A0, A2, A4, A6. But, but most processors are such that their vector loads and stores, they want the data that they're reading and writing to be consecutive in memory. So there's, there's not any direct way with a vector instruction, perhaps on the architecture you're on, that you can actually read this, this data in in the way that it's stored. So you'd have to resort to maybe using non-vector loads and basically reading things kind of one at a time and then sticking them into a vector register, which would probably lead to much less efficient code. So when this sort of problem arises, there's, there's kind of two general approaches you can take to resolving it. Um, one of them is you can change the layout in memory of your data so that it actually is consecutive. Or the other thing that you can do is you can change the algorithm. So like you keep the layout the same, but change the way the algorithm works so that it's accessing things in a way that's consecutive. So there's kind of two general approaches that we could take. Um, yet another problem that we can run into with uh, vectorization, another obstacle to vectorization is the alignment of the data. Um, and, and the issue here is that often for the vector registers, when you're doing like loads and stores with the vector register, so you're basically loading a, a vector register from memory or storing a vector register to memory, uh, suppose that maybe the ve vector register is storing maybe like four floats or something like that. Um, it may be the case that the alignment that's required on the particular processor you're on maybe has like an alignment to say four byte, a four byte boundary for float. So like a line of float might be four, for example. But it might be the case that the CPU instructions that do vector loads and stores of floats, they have a stricter alignment. Like it's more than four. It has to maybe be on a 16 byte boundary or a 32 byte boundary or a 64 byte boundary. So if you just kind of let the like kind of take the path of least resistance. When you create variables in the language, it creates them with the minimal alignment that's good enough for the data in those types. So maybe if you create if you created a float type, a float object, and you don't do anything special, and suppose that it is the case that a line of for float is four for the particular processor you're on, the compiler is only obligated to align it to a four byte boundary because that's good enough. But if you're doing something like this, where now you're trying to load that data into vector registers, you may then need a stricter alignment. So unless you go out of your way to make sure that that data has an even stricter alignment than what float by itself requires, this may cause problems with respect to vectorization. Because the compiler wants to use vector, and vector loads and stores to like read and write the data from memory, but it may be the case it's not properly aligned, in which case either you maybe take a big performance hit if the compiler will let you do misaligned accesses, or some processors, they just won't let you do it. Like you'll get a hardware exception if you try to do it. It's actually physically not possible for the processor to do misaligned accesses. So because it's either, you know, in practice, either it will cause a hardware exception, like it won't work at all, or it will just be very, very inefficient. In practice, you just don't want to do it. So you wouldn't want to do vectorization probably if the data was not aligned properly. Um, so how do we combat this problem? Well, we've sort of seen this part in some other parts of the course that we've, we've talked about. I think in the memory management section, we saw how we can, you know, using the align as specifier, for example, exert some control over how things are aligned. So this is a basic way that we can approach the data alignment problem, at least in part, is we can make sure that our data has the proper alignment. Um, alternatively, there's some other approaches that we might be able to use as well. Uh, sorry, question? Yeah, would that be like kind of specializing as a, like a, for a processor kind of level, because like changing from Intel to AMD, you probably wouldn't have the same requirements. Yeah, the, these sorts of things are all very processor specific. This is why I'm kind of careful to say, like, you know, if on the architecture you're on, suppose it's the align of for float is four. It could be like anything. Um, the pattern that you most typically tend to see, although there's no rule that says it has to be the case, usually like data that size is n bytes, it tends to require an alignment which is n bytes, boundaries, but there's no rule that says it has to be this way, and certainly there's there's counterexamples, I'm sure, for this. Um, but generally, like if you're trying to access data in n byte chunks, ten, it tends to be kind of either strongly preferred or required that it be on an n byte boundary. Any other questions? Yeah? If you have two processors, you're targeting two different processors mm -hmm. and they have different alignments, like one's like 8 bytes, one's 16 or something. Mm -hmm. uh, how you just let it do the auto? Yeah, I mean, you have the align of, like, the align of operator that you can use. So, like, what you try to do is, like, rather than hard coding specific values into your code, like, you can use a line of to query. Like, you say a line of float, and then that will tell you on the particular architecture you're compiling for what the alignment of is it, like, the alignment is. And then you have to make sure you write all of your code to use that constant in the appropriate places. So, like, a common bug is you, you mess up somewhere, and then something doesn't have the right alignment. 
And, and if maybe if you're lucky, it will just violently crash and then you know something's wrong. But what, what could also happen is maybe it just runs with much poorer performance and you don't really notice the code kind of sucks in terms of its performance and you're not really sure why. And it's a bunch of places where this sort of effect is happening. Yeah. Um, any other questions? So in terms of how we can handle misaligned data, um, even if data is misaligned, it may st still be possible for the compiler to perform some kind of uh, vectorization. So typically, how this would happen is if the data is not aligned properly, uh, what it will do is it will peel off the first few iterations of a loop. Like you're trying to vectorize a loop, but the data that you're processing in the loop is not aligned properly. The alignment's not strict enough. So what you do is like peel off the first few iterations, like unroll the first few iterations of the loop, the ones at the beginning, and run them as like a non, like a, not as a loop, but just as individual statements. So the startup part for the code handles in a non-vectorized way, the part that's not aligned properly. And as you keep proceeding through the data, eventually you're gonna reach a point where it's aligned properly. Then what you do is you, you go into a vectorized like loop to handle the rest of that data. And at the tail end, you may have some data that, that it didn't, because you're, the data you're processing might not be an integer so, integer multiple to vector size. So at the end, you might have something that doesn't completely fill a vector. So that kind of pattern that you might have for dealing with misaligned data is you unroll, un unroll kind of the first few iterations of the loop and just do them as a, you know, a non-loop that's not a vectorized. Then you do like the main chunk of the data as a vectorized loop. And at the end, if things didn't kind of evenly divide out, then you have a part which handles, which is not vectorized, which just handles kind of the leftover part. Because maybe your vector length is say eight, but when you were done, the loop, you, the very last iteration, you would have seven elements. So you, you don't do them in the vectorized loop. Instead, you do it as a kind of a, a scalar, like a scalar version at the end. Uh, so, that, so it's not, not that it's impossible to deal with misaligned data, but when you're doing things in this way, you're, you're kind of greatly complicating the code by having this like a special condition, like special code for handling the startup of the loop and then special code for handling at the end. Whereas if instead you make sure things, everything is well aligned and you make sure that the data is actually an integer multiple of the vector size, then the code that can be generated can be much cleaner and be much more efficient and run faster for this reason. On this slide, I have an example to illustrate the process that I was just describing for how we can handle misaligned data when we're trying to vectorize loops. So in this particular example, we're going to assume with the architecture that we're using that the size of double is eight bytes. The alignment for doubles is eight bytes. And we're going to assume that the vector registers on the architecture that we're on are 128 bit registers. So in other words, 16 bytes per register. And we're also going to assume that vector loads and stores require that data be aligned on 16 byte boundaries. And what we're going to do in this example is we're going to consider vectorizing the loop that's shown off to the left with a vectorization factor of two. So if you look at the code that we want to consider vectorizing, it's this loop over here. So essentially what we have is an array of doubles called X, particularly we have 10 doubles in this array. And essentially what we have is a loop, which is looping over each of the elements in this array and doubling them by multiplying by two here. Now, if we look at the way that the array is laid out in memory, just by luck of the draw, the array X does not start on a 16 byte boundary. So these vertical lines here are illustrating where the 16 byte boundaries are. So the array X actually starts exactly midway between two uh, 16 byte boundaries. So if we try, when we try to vectorize the loop, this first element here, we can't actually do a vector load because it's not actually aligned on a 16 byte boundary. So what we do is we peel off the first iteration of the loop and just execute it with a simple scalar operation. So this is gonna be done using scalar type processing. Then when we proceed onto the next iteration in the loop, we can actually group, start grouping things into pairs of two elements at a time. In other words, we can actually implement the next few steps using a vectorized loop. So the, because now we have data, the data X1 is aligned on a 16 byte boundary. So we have our vectorized loop is gonna read X1 and X2 and process them together, then read X3 and X4, process them together in another iteration of the vectorized loop, and then read X5, X6, process them together, read X7, X8, process them together, and effectively we have four iterations of a vectorized loop. And then this last element here is handled as a special case after the vectorized loop finishes because um, this particular element here, although it's aligned properly for doing a vector, vector uh, read or write to memory, the issue here is we don't actually need to load all, like both elements in the, in the vector. We only need to read one because this other slot here is not actually being used by the array. So we handle this just by a scalar operation. So this is the basic process that we go through to handle misaligned data. And I mean, the key thing here is that we have this extra startup step that unpeels off the first few iterations of the loop so that what we're left with is all aligned properly.
and then we just apply a vectorized loop. Earlier in the course, we saw that we can use the align as qualifier in certain contexts in order to exert some control over the alignment of data. In the case that we're doing, if we're doing an allocation on the heap, we can use the function from the standard library called aligned alloc, and this will allocate a chunk of memory with a particular alignment. So aligned alloc takes two parameters, one which is the alignment that you want, and one which is the size of the chunk of memory that you want. And any memory that's allocated with aligned alloc needs to be freed with the function free. So if we look at the code example on this slide, this is showing both the use of align as as well as aligned alloc. So we have a character buffer here, a buffer of char, which is 64K in size. And we want to force it to have a particular alignment. So we're specifying align as, and we're saying 4096. So this will ensure that this buffer is placed at an address that starts on a well, it starts on an address which is evenly divisible by 4096. And if we do a static assert here to make sure that the alignment is what we expect, we can check the alignment of buffer. And in fact, this assertion will pass because it's aligned on a 4096 byte boundary. Suppose though that we want to allocate from the heap and make sure that the allocated memory has a particular alignment. So here what we're going to do is we're gonna allocate enough memory for a single float on the heap and we want to make sure that it's aligned on a 4096 byte boundary. So we invoke aligned alloc and the first argument to this function is the alignment. So this is going to allocate memory that's aligned on a 4096 byte boundary. And then the second argument is specifying the size of the chunk of memory we want to allocate. So we want to allocate memory that's big enough to hold a float. And then we take the pointer that got returned and just to show that in fact it is aligned in the way we expect, we're taking this pointer FP and we're going to cast it into this special type, which is an integral type that can essentially hold the value of a pointer. And we take this uh, integer value and we take the remainder after dividing by 4096 and we would expect that this should be zero because this pointer should represent an address which is evenly divisible by 4096. And in fact, this assertion will pass. So we do have the alignment that we're expecting. And then lastly, we use the free function in order to free the pointer that was allocated with aligned alloc. So if the data does have the appropriate alignment, how can we signal this to the compiler? Because if the compiler is just looking at, you know, for example, um, well, suppose we have this code here. So we have a function that's taking in uh, two pointers to arrays of floats and then a size, which is the presumably like the size of the arrays, like how long these arrays are. And then we're doing some kind of computation down here with the data in these arrays. And we want to somehow signal to the compiler that whenever we call this function, we're always going to make sure that the data has a certain alignment. If we didn't do this, in principle, the compiler, at least I think in most cases, would be able to check to see whether the data is aligned properly. Uh, so it's, it's not such a big deal in the sense that the compiler couldn't figure out anything if we don't provide information to it. But the thing that would be beneficial to the compiler is if we tell it up front that these pointers are always going to have a certain alignment, then the compiler doesn't have to generate code to handle the cases of what happens if the code's misaligned. Because uh, if it tries to vectorize this loop here, for example, and it doesn't know whether the pointers A and B have the proper alignment for whatever is happening inside the loop, then it will probably have to resort to this, this the situation that I was describing where you have to peel off the first few iterations of the loop, execute them, not vectorized. Then you ex execute most of the iterations vectorized and then you kind of cover the tail end of the stuff that didn't kind of evenly fit into the last vector at the end. Uh, but if the compiler knows that, that the data is properly aligned, it doesn't need to generate the, at least the, the code that peels off the first few iterations. And typically when you're using vector operations, often you tend to have the data actually is an integer multiple of the vector length. So um, in the best case, then the compiler, if it has knowledge that the data is properly aligned, it may be able to write or generate very, very efficient uh, vectorized code. But the question then becomes, well, how can we provide this kind of information to the compiler? How can we tell the compiler that whenever we're, we're calling this function, these pointers A and B always have a certain alignment or better, like they at least have the al certain alignment. So suppose in this particular case, for some reason, we know that these functions, this function is always gonna be invoked such that A and B are always aligned to 64 byte boundaries. So their, their addresses are always evenly divisible by 64. Um, if we wanted to do this, there's a function called built in assume aligned, which is supported by GCC and Clang. I don't know offhand if, if Microsoft's compiler has a similar thing. I suspect probably it does, but if it is, I haven't got it documented here. Um, 
this is not part of the, the language standard. So this is like any of these things that are starting with double underscores and so on are kind of things that, you know, use, but beware. I mean, because that they're kind of not guaranteed to be portable. Um, but what this function does, this so-called uh, built-in assume aligned, um, it will not probably generate any code from the compiler. It's a special function that's built into to, built into the compiler. And what it does, it takes a pointer and an alignment that that pointer is supposed to have, and then it just returns back the same pointer. The, the value that's returned is just P. So the, the function doesn't do anything. It just returns back the pointer you gave to it. But the fact that you're calling this function, what it's saying to the compiler is the fact that I'm, I'm calling this function with this pointer plugged in and this value of 64, it's telling the compiler, trust me, this pointer here is always aligned to a 64 byte boundary. So any optimization, anything you want to do that would assume require the fact that the data is lined in this way, it's safe to do. Uh, so what we've done is for both of these uh, pointers A and B, we've used this uh, built-in assume aligned. Uh, so what's happening is we're telling the compiler that these pointers A and B are aligned to 64 byte boundaries. And this might be quite helpful for the compiler when it's trying to optimize whatever might be in this uh, dot, dot, dot part of, of the loop, assuming that it's trying to vectorize it. Any questions? So again, this is essentially a mechanism whereby we can give hints to the compiler to say what the alignment of the data is that's involved. Um, generally, in terms of when uh, vectorization may or may not be profitable, I, we can make a few comments. I mean, a vectorization sometimes can provide very significant speed up. And in the best case, if you have a vector length of L, then you might get an L times speed up. Um, the, the, the L times speed up is sort of assuming that the vector instructions kind of run L times faster than the, L, you know, the, the same corresponding scalar operations. But sometimes vector operations may actually run a little bit slower or they may require a little bit more complicated code and so on. So you might not always necessarily get an L times speed up, but at least in theory, you could hope to, in the best case, get L times speed up. Um, some reasons why you might not get the, the kind of improvement that you might hope for with vectorization. Sometimes vector loop bodies can be larger than the scalar forms. It really depends on the architecture, like how long are opcodes and various other factors. But it's possible that the code gets generated, could be larger, like long, like more bytes than the code for the non-vectorized loop, which could sometimes cause some impact in terms of the, the speed or at least the size of the code. Um, for some of the approaches, like dealing with some of the problems that can arise in vectorization that we talked about, sometimes you may like run some of the code, you have, like, you have a loop that you want to vectorize, but you can't vectorize the whole loop, so you peel off some of the iterations and do them separately. And these things may introduce some additional like startup cost if you have like a, a thing, thing that's happening to handle the maybe misaligned data at the beginning where you're peeling off a few iterations instead of just doing everything with a vectorized loop. This could maybe incur some cost. And other things that we talked about, whereas where, for example, if the compiler is trying to detect aliasing at runtime and it puts in a runtime check, then this can incur overhead as well. Um, it, yeah, I guess that, that's the bullet here. I just got a bit ahead of myself. Um, and vector instructions, uh, sometimes they may run more slow relative to the speed of a scalar operation. So it's not necessarily the case that vector instructions run at, at equal speed as the non-vector versions, in which case you might not get the full speed up of L if the vector length is L. And the next few slides, what I have are a, a, kind of a running code example. It's the same code example that runs across a number of slides where effectively what we're trying to do is take some uh, relatively simple function. Uh, what we have here is a function which takes two arrays that are size n, and where n is some compile time constant. And it's just adding the elements of the array A into the array B. And uh, what we want to do is we want to try to vectorize this and kind of get squeeze out the very best kind of assembly code that can be generated from this as possible. Um, so the code that we're starting out with here, um, this is probably not going to lead to very good optimized assembly code just because there's so many things the compiler doesn't really know. We have like references here, which are the same sort of problems you have with pointers. There can be aliasing, like our A and B actually referring to the same regions in memory. Do the vectors A and B overlap partially or fully, or maybe A and B actually refer exactly to the same thing. Um, so there's the issue of aliasing, um, also, how are these things aligned? The compiler doesn't really know anything other than the fact that at least it must have the alignment of whatever T is. Like The compiler will always make sure that things have at least the minimal alignment that's required for the type. Otherwise, your code may crash. You, know, you might generate hardware exceptions when it runs. But it won't guarantee that there's strict, it provides even more strong alignment than what's minimally required. Uh, so we don't really know too much about what the alignment of A and B might be in terms of whether they might be over-aligned and have stricter alignment than what's strictly required for the type T. 
and, and so on. So like there's a number of problems with this. Um, so for example, if I haven't actually included the assembly code that's produced by this, because it actually, I think, goes on for a few slides. It's like quite long and inefficient. Um, but essentially, it's going to introduce like a, a runtime check for whether there's aliasing. So you're essentially going to get something that generally looks like if there's aliasing, do a non-vectorized version of the loop, else do a vectorized version of the loop. And then there's other complications added to this because it doesn't, doesn't know what the alignment of the types are, whether they're more strongly aligned than what's required for type T. So then this add is, adds extra, like even more kind of extra code to deal with that and so on. So things get kind of very ugly very quickly. So then we move on to kind of version two of the code. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to give a hint to the compiler to say, hey, there's no aliasing. So don't worry about this. Any optimizations that you can do, as long as you have the knowledge that aliasing isn't going to happen, please do it. So the way that we accomplish this is we add the restrict keyword to these references. So this is saying that basically you can't have aliasing involving A and B here. So because of this, the compiler knows that aliasing can't happen. So again, any of the, the gross stuff that it would have otherwise had to do to handle the fact, well, maybe there is aliasing or maybe there isn't, it can now just throw all that away and say, there isn't aliasing, I'm gonna only focus on generating code to handle that case. And of course, it's really important if you say there isn't aliasing, there better not be aliasing. Otherwise, your code's going to probably break because the compiler will actually generate code that wouldn't be valid if the code actually does exhibit aliasing. Now, although we've improved the situation with respect to aliasing, we still haven't addressed the issue of alignment. So the compiler doesn't have any hint from us in terms of what the alignment of the arrays A and B are. Uh, so because of this, the compiler is going to need to generate code that can handle any valid alignment, which is going to lead to less efficient vectorized code. So what we'd like to consider next is how we can improve upon the situation by providing the compiler with some hints about how the data is aligned so that it can do a better job at producing vectorized code for this loop. And then we go on to version three of the code. What we're doing is we're saying, uh, we want to give some information to the compiler about alignment. So not only does it know aliasing doesn't happen, but it also knows that the data is like kind of sufficiently well aligned that it doesn't need to do kind of gross stuff to, to, to handle misaligned data accesses. So what we're doing in this particular case, we have this uh, template parameter here, which is alignment. So when the person calls this function, they have to provide these template parameters. Uh, so when the person calls, whoever calls this function, they're specifying some kind of alignment. And what this is saying is, what is the alignment of, of A and B? So essentially the person who's calling is providing some information. And then we're using this here in order to call this built-in assume align function. And basically what we're saying is that these arrays A and B, they're aligned with this alignment align. Where align is probably, you know, you would probably be doing this unless in some cases align is going to be stricter than the alignment of T. So like T has some minimal alignment, what you get back when you say a line of T in the language, but that's only kind of the minimal thing, which is what the language guarantees if you don't do anything special. But you may want to over align types, for example, when you're doing vector operations. Uh, so we pass this parameter in, which presumably is greater than or equal to the alignment of the type T, and the compiler can then use this knowledge when it's trying to optimize this loop here. And if we combine all these things together, so we're like using restrict to say aliasing doesn't happen, we're using built-in assume align to say the data has alignment of at least whatever this thing is here, align here. If we do all of this and then look at, uh, for the case of x86, this was I think generated with GCC. Uh, what I did was I looked at the assembly code that's generated for this add function in the case that n, n is just a number of like elements in the array. So like how many times we're looping here. So this parameter n is just the size of the array. So we're saying the array has 64K elements in it. And we're also saying that the second parameter here is the alignment. So we're saying that the data, we've been careful to make sure that whenever we code call this function, the uh, values that we're passing in have the alignment of 16 times, like 16 times more strict than the alignment of float. If, if float had to be aligned on say four byte boundaries, so a line of float was for example four, this would give you 16 times four, so it's 16 times more strict. Um, and then the, the last parameter here is just the, the type of the elements, which is float. And if we look at the assembly code that's generated, it's very, very tight loop. And I, depending on how much you know about x86 in, instruction set, I mean, I don't claim to be a real expert about it, but um, these three operations here are all vector operations. This is basically a, a, a load or store, like a move operation. It's just basically either moving to or from memory. And this is a vector add operation. And effectively what's happening here, this is if we just look at the inner loop here, I mean, basically inner loop is the code we're looking at here. And effectively what happens, this is just a read, modify, write. Like what's happening is you're gonna read this value, modify it by adding this value to it, and then write the result back. And this is what's happening here. The, the first move here is the read, 
Then we're adding to it in, while it's in the CPU registers. This is the modify part, and then we write it back. And then we're basically checking whether the termination condition for the loop has been reached. If it's not, we jump up to the top of the loop and we keep iterating. So this is like a very tight loop and very, very efficient. And probably this is the best we could do, maybe even if we hand code the assembly. Um, so, but it, I, I didn't show the ex what you end up with with version two and version one of this code, but it's like really long and bulky and much, much less efficient. So there's like a huge gain to using this uh, built-in assumed aligned and the restrict uh, qualifier as well. But again, they're non-standard, so that's the downside. And we have to be a little bit careful maybe how we choose these alignments too, because like this is for x86 and so on, and I know what the size of float is and kind of work things out so that the alignment is kind of what the vector operations want to get kind of the best uh, instructions being generated. So it's a little bit brittle in that sense. You go from one platform to another, you may have to kind of fiddle with things a little bit to get the assembly code just the way you want for that particular platform. Any questions? And then this is just an example of actually using that function. So again, we have to be very careful when we're using this function that we don't violate the promises that we're making to the compiler. So we are promising like a certain alignment. So this is just illustrating how you might use the, the function. So here we're invoking the add function here, giving it these, these arrays A and B. Uh, so we've created the arrays up above. A and B are arrays of uh, floats. And they're just made static here just because these are kind of big arrays. And I don't want to overflow the stack. So we made them static so they're not allocated on the stack. And I'm allocating them so they have this alignment which is the, the alignment that when I call this function, I'm promising they have this alignment. So this has to, this parameter here has to match up with the reality of what the alignment of these two arrays here are. So I've been careful to make sure the alignment is satisfied. Uh, clearly they're not aliasing. Like, so when I call this, make this call here, A and B are distinct arrays, that these things are not overlapping in any way. So I've made sure that aliasing doesn't happen as well because the function, the way I wrote the add function, it was also promising aliasing wouldn't happen. So I, I've fulfilled all of these promises. So the compiler, assuming that the compiler is not buggy, the code it generates is, is going to work. And probably it's going to be very efficient as well in terms of the vectorized code that's generated. Uh, but if, for example, you did you specified a wrong value for alignment here, it didn't actually match the alignment that you had, then things could break. And you may actually have you know, a different computation actually being performed and wrong results generated. Any questions? Um, in terms of like practically speaking, if you're using a compiler, like what sorts of things is it likely to be able to vectorize in practice versus what things are maybe too much for it to handle? This, this slide here is just giving some kind of general guidelines about, I mean, it's, it's hard to say because it's very compiler specific. Some compilers may be much better at vectorizing than others. And also depending on the architecture you're compiling for, even, even if the compilers are equally good, maybe some architectures are fundamentally easier or more difficult to vectorize uh, depending on how they're structured. So what this is trying to give is some kind of general guidelines about things that typically you can kind of expect, but again, there's not really any guarantees because things are very kind of architecture specific and so on. Okay, so I guess really I haven't, the only thing I haven't covered is just the last bullet here. So just some examples of things that are like requirements that are typically in, imposed in practice by compilers in order for you to have a hope that they can vectorize loops. So it's not like your code won't compile if it violates these, but if it violates some of these, maybe it's much less likely that the compiler is going to vectorize it. So one of the first uh, constraints is if you have a loop that you want to vectorize, uh, typically you want the loop to be countable. What's meant by this is before you enter into the loop, like before you start the loop, you know how many iterations you're going to do. Um, so this kind of implies some things, like for example, it implies that when the loop is running, you can't change your decision about how many iterations are gonna take place. You have to know upfront before you start the loop how many iterations you'll do, and that really is the number that you'll do. You're not gonna later on while you're doing the loop decide, well, I'm gonna run a little bit longer or a little bit shorter. Um, uh, for reasons of control dependencies, you typically want to have straight line code in the loop body. So in the body of the loop, you don't want to have things like ifs or ternary operators or things that are going to cause branches in the code because this makes things more difficult to vectorize. Um, some compilers, they have difficulty when you nest loop to vectorize kind of all the nested loops. They maybe only can vectorize the innermost loop. And another thing that can sometimes cause problems with respect to vectorization is if you start calling functions within the vectorized loop because the problem is the functions that themselves that you're calling are not vectorized because like, there isn't really a notion of that in C++. Um, so unless you're calling things like, you know, kind of things that may be kind of built into the compiler that has special knowledge of things from the standard library, like sine, cos, and so on, where they may map onto actual CPU instructions, which maybe have vector versions, unless you're doing function calls to these sorts of things, probably having function calls in the loop will prevent it from being vectorized. And I guess I better stop here. I just noticed I'm running over time.
Thank <laughs> you.